Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this conference session on empowering small businesses. My name is Brittany Morgan. I'm the Economic Resilience Director at the Miami Foundation, and it is a great, deep privilege to present you with to Maida Owens and Mileka Burgos Flores. I'm going to pass the mic now and would love for each of you to introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about your organization, your role, and anything else that would help the audience get to know you a bit better. Maida, would you like to start? Certainly, yeah. I'm Maida Owens. Um, I'm with the Louisiana Division of the Arts. Uh, that's the State Arts Agency. And I have been managing their folk life program for, uh, well, over three decades now. Um, and rec more recently, I've been in a project that is very different than all the other projects um, that I have uh, done over the years that I've been focused on the connection, intersection between culture and the environment. Uh, you may not know, but Louisiana along with Florida uh, are really on the forefront of uh, sea level rise. And um, so what we're trying to do is, is uh, get participate in the climate adaptation conversation. And I can go into more detail about that. That's excellent. That sounds so exciting. Um, Mileka, please help the audience get to know you and your role a little bit better as well. Yes, thank you so much for the invite. My name is Mileka Burgos Flores. I am the founder and chief executive officer at the Alapara Collaborative CDC, uh, a place-based organization here in Miami, Florida. We are the only Main Street community in the city of Miami. Um, focused on implementing anti-displacement strategies to keep our community strong. Um, our mission is to implement placemaking techniques to foster the identity, support wealth building, and advocate for the equitable, comprehensive, and sustainable community development of our community. Um, in Alapara, we are a minority community, about 79, 80% of the community is Latino. So it's been a marginalized community of color for more than 40 years. 50 years. Um, and, and we're very happy to be able to work with the community and, and really bring a new fresh uh, air where we can build more wealth equity within the community. I think that everybody talks about racial equity and we talk about economic justice, but all of that happens one time. All of that happens making sure that we can root businesses and communities in place um, while preventing that displacement. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. Both of your work sounds incredibly important, and we know that it's a very timely moment to be focusing on all of these issues. We'd also love to hear from the audience, if you don't mind putting in the chat where you're joining us from, your location and or your organization. We'd love to see where folks are joining us from. So now before we segue to our discussion, we're going to spend a couple of minutes viewing a video that will really help ground our understanding in the issues that are facing small businesses, families, and households, not just in Miami or Louisiana, but throughout the country. The goal of this film, which was produced by Ulite Arts and the Community Justice Project, is to give a very human face and context to the data that we all know far too well about small businesses, displacement, Main Street transformation, etc. Um, the film does focus on Alapata, Miami. Meleka, is there anything else you'd like to share before we play the clip? Yeah, like you mentioned, Brittany, the reason why we um, wanted to share this video and really produce this video with Ulai Arts and Community Justice Project um, by filmmaker Ron Baez is because we always talk about displacement in data. And many of the things that we do are data points and PowerPoints. And we really saw the need to showcase that human story. And that's what I hope that people can see in this video. This is something that we honestly started um, working on in about 2016, but we didn't even have the, the we didn't have this, the, the, the solutions. We knew the problem, but we didn't have the solutions. And it took us so long because until we didn't find the solutions, we didn't want to put the information out there in this manner. But it, you know, most importantly, we want people to see the human story um, of displacement and how this really affects people at a very personal level. Excellent, thank you. And so with that, we're gonna roll the clip and we hope that you enjoy this film for the first few minutes of our session today.
Pues no, el nombre mío es Fidel Aquino. Aquí me dicen comercialmente Aquino Taylor. Nací el primero de agosto de 1950 en, en República Dominicana, en la parte este. Y vine sin familia para acá. 14 de febrero de 2006. Solo, con Dios. Cuando tú llegas, te presenta con la realidad. Te da de frente. Los amigos de allá, que tú veías, tan cuando tú vienes aquí y dura una semana, ya otra cosa, ya tú pesa. Tú echa para adelante, porque este es un país de oportunidades. Pero tienes que tirar para adelante y trabajar. Yo tenía dos, dos máquinas de coser, Vi un señor que tenía una sastrería y como yo sabía ese traje, vestido, coger, después me la vendió. El espacio, te lo puedo fijar, que era donde está mi esposa y donde están ellos, de ahí para allá. Y ya esto era donde yo vivía, porque no tenía otra salida. Sí. Tenía que subsistir. Cuando tú tienes vocación de servicio, y deseo de echar para adelante. Y tú tienes tu compañera, tu pareja. Mi, ese ha sido el soporte. Dios y ella. Ella siempre me ha impulsado. Mi nombre es Quintina Tirado. Estoy aquí como su asistente, ayudándole en lo que sea necesario. Yo hacía mucho servicio social en mi país. También. O sea que aquí también lo disfruto con todas y cada una de las personas que vienen a este negocio y yo lo atiendo con amabilidad. Ella me da, me da, para adelante Fidel, para adelante. O sea, cuando tú tienes tu esposa que te ayuda, te da ánimo, eso es lo mejor. Yo digo que lo único que se parece a la naturaleza es la mujer, su bendición de Dios. of rioting, vandalism, and burning forced public safety director Bobby Jones to establish curfews in two predominantly black sections of the county. A North Dade from Northwest 95th Street on the north, I-95 on the east, the Miami River on the south, and Northwest 37th Avenue on the... And today we're talking with SBAN member Maleka Burgos Flores, who is the founding executive director of the Allopatic Collaborative CDC in Miami. Welcome, Malika. Thanks for talking with us. In the in 1980, May of 1980, um, we had an unfortunate event in our community. It was um, it was riots. The death toll now stands at 11, with more than 120 persons injured in the riots, looting, and fires of last night and today. Um, there's a, a, a gentleman called Arthur McDuffie. Uh, Arthur McDuffie was a friend of mine. At one time, he was my next door neighbor. That gentleman was. It was a black gentleman in a motor killed by white police officers. I'm the defendant Michael Watts. As to count four of the information, aggravated battery, not guilty. And right after that, uh, these riots destroyed a lot of our community. One merchant estimates that this 20 square block area that's mostly black will be set back some 10 years. Bob Jackson, Channel 4 News in Alapata. And what happened after that is that no one would insure these businesses. Furniture dealer Fausto Fernandez is no longer insured against riot damage. Fernandez is now concerned that he will lose his business. I need the government help also because this is a big job we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But I'm doing my own now. I owe money to the bank. I got to pay interest. And uh, since that day, the insurance company is fooling around. Don't pay me. The immigrant community that was coming in took upon, you know, the risk of opening up these storefronts starting a new economy slowly but surely um since the early 80s until late late 2000s um it became a micro economy that sustained itself investors and even renters looking for affordable properties in winwood can't find them so they go west of 95 to alapata and they have a crop of affordable housing the biggest concern is that this rent has steadily been going up since um 
past five to seven years mm -hmm. um rent always goes up and that's and that's understandable but it's the pace and the amount of the rent that's going up. The next 10 to 15 years, Alapata will be transformed and booming much like Wynwood. Affordable properties in Wynwood can't find them. Alapata will be transformed like Wynwood. What do you hear these small business owners um, saying to you about this? What are their concerns? What are their needs? Mira, te voy a decir la verdad. Aquí no interesa persona. Aquí lo que interesa el dinero. Si tú tienes un negocio, te renta, paga tu impuesto, paga todo perfecto. Pero si tú no lo produces, no existe persona. Tiene que desaparecer. There's no reason to go up at the level they have. So it's more about speculation, the, the whole rate rising of the rent. It's it's really concerning for that reason because it's like a forced change. Maybe that may, maybe that service is geared towards the community or maybe not. Right. Because right. sometimes the people from the community are not able to afford that level of rent. So it's people right. that come from elsewhere and now the demographic starts changing and the services that community actually now available because of this whole situation. So it's challenging. Hello, Lucon. So many emotions. Yeah. Sí, estos tres están. Sí, dale. Gracias, Kino. Cuídate. Gracias. Doña, pero venga para acá, ayude el doy, deje ese celular ahí. Aquí no está ahí, lo buena. Los invencionistas no le importan eh, el trabajo de un ser humano que tenga 15 años, 20 años, un local. Y a ellos no le importa eso. Lo que a ellos le importa son, vuelvo y te digo, su número, su capital su interés, eso es lo que marcha, su interés. Vamos para acá ahora. Pero no le duele la comunidad, no le, no le importa la cultura, no, la, lo que ellos la cultura de ellos es su billete, su dinero. Eso es lo que le importa a ellos. Si los capitalistas fueran de nuestra comunidad, de una u otra forma, fuera más sensible, considero yo. Cuando las comunidades la empujan a salir, tú sabes que lo que vienen es personas nuevas, personas que ya tú no vas a volver allí porque ya tú no sabes quiénes son. Entonces, es mejor que cambie para bien, para lo positivo, no es que vayamos hacia atrás, no, porque todo el mundo quiere avanzar, pero que también los que estamos aquí seamos parte de ese cambio. Necesitamos del apoyo de las personas más, más relevancia, más fuerza, que tengan autoridad, que vengan en, en favor de la comunidad para que se mantengan los negocios que aquí existen y puedan estar tranquilos. Eh, no hay nada que tú le puedas decir a tu nieto, oye, eso era la pata, ahí. Ahí yo tenía negocio. ¿Y dónde lo tenía abuelo? Mira, en ese edificio que ni se ve. Pero si hay algo que quede registrado. Y dice, mira, ahí yo, tu abuelo tenía un negocio ahí. ¿Y quién lo siguió? Un nieto. Porque propio. La solución es el dueño. Y no cansarnos de luchar. La lucha es larga, pero tenemos que estar unificados. 
contando con ustedes y unidos, yo estoy seguro que lo vamos a, lo vamos a tener. Ser el dueño, punto. Cóbrale a él, gente. Ya voy para ti. What an incredible, very, very moving film. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Mileka. So I'd love to ask our, both of our panelists, you know, what resonated for you in that? What was most uh, uh, similar or different from your experiences in your respective communities? And how are you feeling following viewing that film? Maya, you want to start? Okay, sure. Um, I thought it was uh, so compelling, uh, so wonderfully presented. Um, and it really shows how important small businesses are in any community's uh, sense of place. That, you know, they often are gathering uh, places and, um, you know, help create the downtown or, you know, the, the uh, nexus of people that, binds us together, but, you know, sense of place is, is so important. Um, and the small businesses are a vital part of that. So without them, it's, you know, it will definitely affect a community. Yeah, aside from the obvious business story, I, I think of family. I think of the fact that it's a family business. It's, it's run by the husband and the wife. And, and how, the, at least in Miami, about 79% of businesses in Miami are family owned and how um, this is so meaningful to every single family and, and, and the support they receive and, and how we may see a business, but behind that business, there's so many families that that's, you know, their livelihood and the future of, of that family is, is so attached to, to how that business does. That's right. That's right. Those are such incredibly important points to consider and make sure that we keep front and center when thinking about these issues. We'd also love for the audience to weigh in. Please share, feel free to share a few words in the chat. Let us know what was most resonant for you in that film or how it strikes a chord with anything you might be experiencing in your local community as well. So now that we're grounded in these issues and like Milika said, the lived experience of the families who are truly behind some of these challenges, let's discuss potential solutions and the path forward. So to start, how do you feel it is uh, most possible to empower and truly involve community members so that they feel that they are engaged in these processes of rebuilding and anti-displacement versus feeling like it's happening to them? And we'd love to, for you all to share with the audience some specific examples of how you're accomplishing this. Um, so Maida, would you like to begin? Okay, well, again, I'm working at a state level, so not, not in a specific community. And what we decided uh, was that we really needed to it, participate in the uh, what's called the community resilience conversation and to get culture added to that. And, you know, uh, historic preservation, and it, when I say the word culture, I mean, you know, uh, the, as the broadest definition and not not uh, not a narrow one at all. 
Um, but that we, what we really have to do is influence policy. And so, um, you know, we, what we did is started uh, gathering. We simply started the conversation and we had, we've been having Zoom gatherings once a month for the last year and uh, identifying people who felt the same way. And so uh, we have been working uh, with environmentalists who thought the human dimension needed to be highlighted more. Um, and then we started attracting state agency people and they've been watching us and actually uh, FEMA and we have all kinds of people who, who drop in on us to see how we're articulating this as a, and they've said that, you know, they're looking for different ways to engage people, but, but it really boils down to changing the policies, getting community members involved in all stages of planning at all levels. That that's the only way it's going to be. It, it can't continue to simply be plans uh, that are practically finished and then get some community input. Um, so that's been our focus in Louisiana. And we call this the Bayou Culture Collaborative. Um, the, the Louisiana Folklore Society is the uh, hub of this activity. And I participate, my state program participates in that. Yeah, that's incredibly important. Mileko, how about you? What does this process look like? Yeah, my dad mentioned something so vital and that is done as a practice it, you know, from the top down and is creating a plan and asking the community about it after, not including the community from the get-go. And I think that it's, if I mean, it, it just doesn't make any sense if you really you go back to, to the core and say, if these are the people that are going to be using this service, the streets, this, you know, ecosystem, this, this community, they should be the one, their culture, their needs, the way that they interact with each other should be the one that informs how, how the urban planning happens, how those funds are being um, dispersed. You know, I think that the community should be center stage. Um, we do pride ourselves in making sure that our community is center stage to everything that we do. That's why we use the Main Street approach. Main Street um, has been an amazing partner in teaching us how to use the four the the, the four uh, pillars of Main Street um, to make sure that we um, keep the community engaged, that we have the economic vitality, that the streetscape and the design of the area, the historic preservation works for us, but also that we are able to promote the area and the businesses. So the Main Street approach, like having that framework to work from, is one of the ways. The other way is to make sure that they understand why they are engaged. Their why is really important because their why is not, not the storefront. Their why is that they want to put their kids through college. Their why is that American dream. Their why is because they want to make sure that they reach a specific, you know, business goal or family goal. So every single time they start a business, is it, it's because they have a goal. I mean, aside from putting food on the table, there's more behind that. So there's an economic freedom that they that they may be searching. There's, there's a, a lot of different reasons and mistake that we try not to make is assume that every business wants to grow to be a multinational corporation or have you know number of different um, branches not every business wants that we start there also we meet the businesses where they are and we ask them where do why do you start the business and where do you want to go so making sure that we have that at the cost at, at the core is important the other thing that we do is that we educate them about the problem it's not what the, it's, it's one thing is their live experience. And the other thing is the data, is the information, is the programs, is how did we arrive at this location? You know, Alapata was redlined. You know, if you look at pictures of Alapata in the 1950s and the 1940s, there were many places where you can get a loan where you have access to capital in a way. But then after um, it became a community of color, all of that went away. So there's a history to these things. Um, we can never forget a racial past. We can never for move forward without addressing it. 
And I always bring that up because we really want to move forward and do great. But let's look at the past and let's clean it up. Let's clean it up. So right now we are a bank desert. We barely have it in our community. So that is something that is that is systematic. And we want to make sure that our community understands how those systems work. So we educate them about the problem, but we also educate them about the solutions. We're not victimizing people here. They're not victims. They are in a great opportunity to be part of the transformation of their community. So that's what we want to make sure that we do. And last but not least is that we look always for the community unity. Like something that was really striking during, you know, when we started doing a lot of these programs, especially during the pandemic, is that there's people that were two blocks away that would never, that they had never speaking to or spoken to each other. Um, they have seen each other, they could say hi, but they never had a meaningful conversation. So making sure that we, that we um, kind of host and, and, and have that platform for them to be in community, in real community, and be able to share with one another and have a compromise and a goal for themselves that fits into the goal for the community. And that's, and you know, I always say to them, you're either, at the, you're either at the table or you're on the menu. So if you're not showing up, you're on the menu. And, and if you're on the menu, you're on the menu, or you could be at the table making the decisions. So it's, it's making sure that they don't only have the access but they also know what they, that they know what to do with that access. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I love the themes that both of you touched on in terms of inclusion, right, and participatory, and uh, whether it's the Zoom groups that you know your organization has facilitated, uh, made us statewide, or Malika that's even bringing one business owner to befriend another down the street. I think that type of connection is so invaluable. Um, you know, our next question that we'd love for you two to explore is kind of driving the connection between the preservation of buildings, of businesses, versus the preservation of families, business owners, and the people who underlie those buildings. You started to touch on that, Mileka, when you talked about the Main Street approach. You know, at times we can be so concerned to preserve places. How do we also make sure that we're preserving people and, and their livelihoods? And so mm -hmm. um, I will take this first question to, to Maida again. Um, and, wh and what is your approach? How do you think about these intertwined issues? Uh, well, to me, it's all, um, it, it, it is all intertwined. You know, scientists call uh, the climate changes that are happening uh, a super wicked problem. And most of the attention is on the science of it and not, the, you know, what, what, we, what they call the human dimension. And I think it's real important for everybody that's involved in these issues to become more familiar with the uh, climate adaptation world and understand their jargon and, and, and so that you can participate. And it is quite a learning curve. It took, you know, I started diving into this about four years ago and it, you know, it, it took some work to um, figure out sometimes what they were talking about because they were often using the words that you know, but they have a very different meaning for them. And an exa good example of that is what they refer to as the community resilience conversation. And to me, when I hear community resilience, I think of you know, the, the individuals, the businesses, the strength of you know, the connections, that vital, um, uh, you know, that sense of place in a community that is so tied to a place, uh, you know, the, all the relationships. That's not what they're talking about at all. They're in Louisiana. They're probably talking about planting mangroves to slow down a storm surge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I have a feeling <laughs> there are very few people in this room that would have immediately uh, thought of mangrove planting when you say community resilience. So um, part of what I have been doing is giving workshops, introducing people to uh, this. And that's something I'll be more than happy to, to dive into more, but it's a vast topic. I think it's really critical though, because if you're at the table, you have to be prepared to talk. That's right. And so you really need to get us, since you're the one that wants to get to the table, you've got to learn their conversation too. 
you know, and you can't just expect them, you know, to come in without you um, helping interpret some of the things that, that you're talking mm -hmm. and you want to talk about. Um, it, it's tricky. Uh, and part of the problem is that so many of the agencies don't have anybody on staff that really understands what they call the human dimension. And that's a real important concept that everybody needs to become more familiar with if you're not already, because that is every, that's all the cultural issues that we've been talking about and the main, you know, all the, the, the small business, but it's also mental health. Uh, land use is considered the human dimension and that's huge in what y'all are talking about you know, the, what, what's happening here. Um, because what's really needed is that the land use policies be changed. That And that is something the local people have a certain amount of power over, you know, the, the, the municipalities um, and, and, and further the state not, you know, are not, are the ones that are going to uh, influence what can and cannot be done, that they do have the power to say no to a multinational corporation. So important, so important. I love this interplay between the built environment and the people who inhabit it. They're not mutually exclusive. They definitely interplay with one another. Um, Milika, what would you add to this conversation? It reminded me, the question reminded me of what Quintina, the wife of Fidel said in the video. She said, uh, when displacement, when people leave, they don't come back because the people that they knew um, are not there anymore. And it's basically this, the, 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 the lack of connection, the, the lack of connectivity that displacement creates between a community and not just its residents, but the people that come to that location. Uh, for example, in Alapara, that's what's known in Miami as uh, Little Santo Domingo, El Barrio Dominicano. That's where the community gathers and, and and where we have all the bodegas and, and so on. So once they're not there anymore, Dominicans from all over Miami are not may not come to the area because that store is gone. We have an example of um, one, one of those stores um, that has been displaced three or four times. And it's other business owners that kind of catch them and say, you need to remain in the community. And they have really moved because of displacement because where they were the first time got demolished and then they moved to another location and that location got demolished and they moved to another location and then they moved literally they moved like four four or five times so but it was the community that that understood that the importance of that um cultural um asset that we have that that we couldn't let it go so at the end of the day places are that container where everything happens um and that's what they important because they're that container what really makes it stick is that culture. The culture is that thread, that fabric that unites us all and that holds the identity of that community together. So that's why culture is so important. And, and I'm glad that people are now seeing in the preservation conversation, they're not just talking about preserving buildings. They're really talking about cultural preservation because that's when you talk about customs and traditions and heritage and things that are passed down from one family to the next. And, and, and that is really beautiful. And that's what makes places unique. Um, and we have that opportunity to continue to, to keep that. The, the alternative is to have places that look the same all over. So that's something that, that I wanna make sure that people really pay attention when we have this preservation conversation. Do we really need to have a landscape that looks just like anywhere USA? Excellent. That's an excellent note to, to end on, Mileka, especially when we think about urban planning and land use. Um, so excellent. We already have some really fantastic questions coming in the chat. I want to make sure we have an opportunity to answer those. So I'll leave you all with our third and final panel question before we open it up for discussion. And this is on the topic of crafting really effective interventions for systems change. We know that there's a role for public policy. There's also a role for, role for programmatic interventions. Uh, what do you see in terms of the respective roles of policy versus programs and any specific examples you'd like to share with us when it comes to systems change using these two different levers? Maida? 
Well, again, that's what we're, we've been focused on. I've already addressed some of this, but I, I want to point out that, that um, respecting the agencies of every individual to decide whether to stay or go, um, and then helping those who do want to go move together in some connected way. Uh, and that's what my priority, per, my personal priority within the uh, Bayou Culture Collaborative is, is to figure out ways to help communities move together. Because the moving your bills, business four or five times is not at all uncommon. Um, and uh, will be increasing because you know, the migration uh, that, that's, it's going to be accelerating even more in, 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 the, in this next decade, but trying to figure out how to sustain the community, the connections. Um, you know, it, it's one thing to try to do this uh, uh, online, you know, that a lot of diaspora groups uh, have very strong connections. Um, you know, with, with on, on online platforms, but what if they could move together? You know, what if they knew uh, where, where people were going? But I want to emphasize that I'm not advocating that people need to move because moving is not necessarily the right um, decision for everyone or right now, because so much of this depends on when. Uh, so, Help, you know, the, the people who decide to stay also need to be supported and and enabled to do this. And instead of just letting a multinational corporation, you know, raise your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Totally agree with you, Maida. But I would actually um, tell you that what's happening, at least here in Miami, and I know it's happening across the country, is a push for displacement where people don't really have a choice to remain in the community where they go to church, where they have their children in school, where they maybe have grown up, where they know and they trust and they have their neighbors and they feel comfortable leaving their children outside because the neighbors across the street or next door are able to watch them as they play. So not having that opportunity to remain in a community because a large development was built and now rent rose three, four hundred dollars overnight is the issue that that we are focusing on, at least here in Miami. And bottom line for us is that we need to create policies that protect the renters. That needs to happen because the reason why we have this massive displacement happening across America is because renters are not protected. Some mm -hmm. states are more prepared than others. Here in Florida, we don't have that luxury just yet. Um, we need to have more capital at the ground level for these businesses. The same way that we have home ownership programs, we could have commercial ownership program for businesses that have been in place for more than 10, 20 years, because these are legacy businesses. They are part of the fabric of that community already. And then programs like the ones that we have that are preparing these businesses to be owners, preparing these businesses to really um, kind of uh, streamline their operations so they can actually have the cash flow and the, and the sustainability to remain in the community, even through employee-owned co-ops. So making sure that they're able to do that, and again, being the access to that capital um, for them to own, and I think that Brittany can talk a little bit more about that later, but I want to make sure that, that, that that's one of the things. The other thing when it comes to protecting is understanding the problem and the game. It is not that people that live, like we both live in, in states that are like almost cities that are very um, climate prone with the storm surge and so on. And we see a lot of people moving from the coastal sides into the inland. And many people wanna say, well, people are moving from let's say Miami beach into Alapada. That's possible. But the real game is not that people from the coast are moving inland. The game is that multinational corporations are acquiring massive plots of land. They're holding it for real estate speculation. 
So a building that was probably $300,000 in 2012, 10 years later, is $2 million. That growth is ridiculous. That level of growth is ridiculous. And that is what's driving that. The other thing that's driving that is poor zoning laws. The fact that, that we have zoning that was just plotted in our community with any without any type of community um, information, you know, or input. That's another thing because now the, the, the potential for that plot of land is way beyond um, what a historic building can bear. We should have different um, zoning for historic properties because if we want to protect that, that you know, preserve the history of that location, it shouldn't be um, zoned for a 25-story building, right? So those are specific things that we can do locally at the state level and and in that in that you know whichever level is possible to truly truly protect not only the communities but also the renters. Last but not least is opportunity zones. Everybody's going crazy with opportunity zones, but what that has created is a lot of people coming into our neighborhoods and not investing in the businesses. They're just grabbing land and letting it sit. So how effective is that truly being in our community? So it's things that have a, a good intention, but they are falling short of their, of their aim. Excellent. No, thank you for walking through all of those dimensions. And some of the questions that we've received in the chat are actually very uh, specific and tactical as they relate to these ownership and acquisition strategies. So I'm going to start to run a couple of those by our um, esteemed panelists and get your thoughts on some of these issues. And so one of the first questions that we received, it looks like a big strategy is to purchase buildings and to keep them for local small businesses. Can you tell us more about this strategy, how it might be funded and how it works? Yes, I think that um, something that has been mentioned in the chat, uh, Brittany, is uh, that they couldn't fully read what the, the text was saying. I'm going to read it for you just so you guys all understand what the text was saying. It said, between 2020 and 2021, the Alapara Collaborative CDC assisted dozens of businesses securing over $3.2 million in access to capital for small businesses in Alapara. Alapara CDC has since launched the Thriving Place Fund to root these legacy businesses in the community as a solution to displacement. The fund is seeking partners to achieve this goal in the Alapara Main Street community known as Little Santo Domingo. As of July 2022, Aquino and his wife can still be found working on their storefront in Alapara's commercial corridor. They both continue to believe in only one solution to the threat of displacement, ownership. So I just wanted to share that very quickly. And, and again, what was your question, Vid? Yeah, absolutely. No, it's incredibly powerful. And I think that the movie helped elicit some questions from our audience around ownership and around the practicalities of that. Um, so I'll combine that last question. You know, They want to understand how this ownership strategy is funded, how it works. Another question would like to know of examples of legacy business owners um, acquiring property. Uh, do you have any examples or uh, ways that you've seen, not just in our community, but throughout the country? What are some effective ownership models that are uh, feasible? Yes, I think that there's a lot of great examples in California. Um, there's an amazing organization called MEDA, Mission Economic Development Agency, that has done an amazing, amazing job um, at ownership um, in their community. So what we are doing in Miami, the way that we see it is that, yes, ownership is the goal because we want to make sure that we can root these businesses in place. Um, the way that we try, we are working on achieving that is, number one, putting the business owners for ownership. Uh, but the way that we also want to do that is through shared equity models. We are not um, kind of helping a business to be a, a sole owner of a property what we are really focusing on is on shared ownership where, uh, for example, a community land trust where we can hold the land because now buildings are about um, are millions of dollars. So it's impossible for one person to to truly buy a, a whole like a property on their own. But if we're able to own the land and be able to lease or 
sell the improvements, um, like a condo, if you just think of a, about a condo, maybe that's a good way to illustrate and kind of simplify the way that we want to do this, um, where they become the owners of their storefront and we collectively work to, you know, to upkeep the building and, and keep everything together. Who is funding it? We are doing that. Um, the businesses themselves are um, doing um, collaborative. So we, we we're collab they're collaborating and saving themselves as one of the factors. We have uh, different programs that are helping us, and maybe Brittany can talk about that a little. And then we also are going to different foundations that are truly um, focusing on preventing displacement and this and the, and the and the economic justice and the economic equity and so on. And and I'm glad that I'm that I arrive at this point about economic justice and equity because. After the pandemic or during the pandemic, after after the the George Floyd um, incident, everyone is promising all these dollars for social justice and equity. And you do cannot do equity without access to capital. You cannot do equity without access to assets. If we want the BIPOC community to move forward, let's build assets with them, not for them, with them they need to be at the table building their assets for themselves and for their families they have to have a little bit of skin on the game to at, at, at the point that they're able but the resources need to be available for them to truly own their storefront their homes for them to have bank accounts for them to be bankable for them to be able to have better credits we have a system that has kept them be, be you know kept them kind of hostage and behind we need to catch them up. That's excellent. Thank you for walking through those different dimensions, Mineka. Um, I can contribute a little bit, at least from the funder and the foundation side, about those types of investments in commercial real estate. But I'd love, Maida, to hear if there's anything that you would like to respond to with regard to our audience questions. I would like to add that um, most planning is uh, colorblind. And if you take a colorblind approach, you simply replicate the injustices of the past. And so this is a this is a challenge within, you know, within the whole planning field is getting to real getting to the point where they can let go of that colorblind approach and address equity. That's excellent. That's an excellent ad, um, Amida. And we've seen kind of the perverse um, outcomes of race neutral and colorblind policies. Um, I will share just, just briefly one of the things that we're exploring at the Miami Foundation through our Open for Business Fund to support historically underserved small businesses is commercial real estate acquisition through shared equity models. Mileka spoke briefly about a community land trust model wherein a nonprofit agency or a government agency stewards the land as a nonprofit landlord instead of a profit motivated for profit developer, for example. Um, some of those stalls or subcomponents of the property can be subdivided into shares, much like a co op would. What we're finding is that small businesses are already paying in a monthly lease what they could afford in a mortgage. They just need that upfront capital. Um, so, we as the foundation from our fund are providing that down payment assistance upfront to collaboratives who can go through the purchase process. Uh, but we're also seeing a lot uh, more frequently is program related investments coming out of foundations. So those are not necessarily grants. Those are um, investments that will return some sort of uh, financial gain in the future. Um, but a lot of foundations increasingly are broadening their impact investing portfolio the returns from investments are in real estate are actually increasing their overall endowment and finding that PRIs are a much more win-win um, way to invest in organizations versus grants. And so um, there's a whole body of work out there. Uh, the Ford Foundation actually released a retrospective on their first five or 10 years of impact investing and their PRIs in housing had a bigger return than their conventional investment portfolio uh, that they're using to grow their endowment. And so just another way that foundations and funders can really use their financial assets to further ownership and specifically shared, uh, shared ownership models. 
And so thank you both. I did want to remain a panelist for most of this uh, engagement, but I would be remiss to not speak about our commercial real estate ownership efforts that we are trying to foster across Miami-Dade. And so I'm looking at the chat. There are a couple more questions around the specifics of land ownership. Um, one person has asked, what would it be called? Uh, what would be called a business opportunity in real estate when the business owns the storefront and someone else owns the land? Uh, yeah. Milego, yeah, it's Milego. a commercial community land trust. And it's That's been right. done. It's been done in, I think, California, Arkansas. There's, there's a few states that have done that, and, and I can definitely share more information. Absolutely. I also... Uh, I attended a, a community land trust training from Grounded Solutions Network. Um, they offer community land trust trainings for anyone who wants to operationalize that in your community. We're seeing it often in the housing space, but I do think there's more room for preservation of small businesses. Um, you know, we didn't talk too much about the, the climate. We, we started to dive into kind of the climate dimension of this work, but how do both of you think that the climate crisis will either accelerate or hinder some of these preservation tactics? How can we make sure that those issues are intertwined and that we keep both the preservation of our environment and the resilience of our community members at the forefront? Mayla, would you like to take that? Oh, um, sure. Um, I'm not quite sure what, I'm not that involved in historic preservation, so I'm not quite sure I'm the one to answer that. Um, but I do think that all the climate issues are simply going to amplify all, you know, what's going on. It'll, um, it, 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 there'll be more and more pushing um, on priorities. I think one of the hardest things is going to be um, determining what can be saved and what can't be. Um, you know, right now we're talking about commercial uh, structures um, and they have access to resources and such that some of the others, uh, you know, public uh, historic sites don't. Um, but figuring out what should and can be saved versus uh, not evading that issue, I guess is a good way to say it, is um, because there will be, there is never going to be enough money to save everything. And so at some point, people are going to have to say, and communities are going to have to say, okay, this, is, this will be abandoned to the water and this will not. Um, and what what does that mean? It, it's it's so sad, but it's mm -hmm. it, it is what our future is going to be is identifying our priorities, and that can only be done by the community. That you know that that's a community process. And um, but anyway, yeah, I really agree with you with, with the word evasion. Um, we need to make, there, there's three words that I'm thinking about as you asked that question, Brittany. Um, one is the word that might have mentioned is evading, right? The other word is intention and the other word is data. So I'm going to start with data. We need to know the data. We need to know the data when it comes to historic preservation and, and the meaning of places and, 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 and locations in our community, understand what needs to be saved and really do the work to preserve those locations. That needs to happen, whether it's location, cultures, communities, that preservation work needs to be done. Um, when it comes to evasion, especially in a state like Florida, we have a big insurance issue. And we like to evade. We like to evade the, the preservation because of the opportunity of development. Um, in the moment that you turn something into a historic preserved location, that's another site that you cannot redevelop and we evade the conversation. And we also evade the conversation of climate mitigation, climate adaptation, because it, it affects our economy. It really affects our economy. If people know that Miami is gonna be in this situation by 2060, why would I invest here, there, or whatever, right? So that's something that we, can, that we keep evading rather than facing, you know? 
So I think that's some, that, that that's that's that word evasion. It's important because we need to stop doing that, and we need to start confronting our realities. Um, so we can have proper insurances. So we can have proper adaptation and proper mitigation of the things that need to be adapted and mitigated. Um, and last but not least is the word intention. We need to be intentional. We need to be intentional about what we want in our communities and we need to include the community in that master plan. It is unacceptable for a city, for a state, for any type of uh, municipality or group or community to have a master plan um, that the community is not involved in any type of urban planning, any type of mitigation effort that the community is not educated about and involved in. So I think that that intention of making sure that you serve the people who are there needs to be at the forefront. Excellent. Yes, I yeah. like to add to the, the, the issue of intention. Um, I, we strong, the Bayou Culture Collaborative focuses on intention quite a bit. Um, and the idea is that, well, we try to help people start thinking like future ancestors. This is an indigenous concept that's found uh, around the world. They, uh, indigenous people generally have a very different relationship with the environment and see themselves as stewards. And so what do I... In, in our workshops, we frequently ask people, what will your great, great grandchildren wish you had done? And is that about, it, do, um, it doesn't matter if you're staying, you're leaving, you know, or somewhere in between, you're moving five times, you know, a block away. Um, but what would your great grandchildren wish you had done? Great question. I love that. It also, it connects the human dimension that we've spoken about, the underlying land itself, as well as being intentional for the future. And so with about three minutes left, we have one final question from the audience. What are the best ways to get people involved in that master plan? We, pay, we, we hit the pavement. We just canvas, we canvas and and we do outreach. I mean, a lot of people use social media, but I'm in a more traditional neighborhood where access to technology is not a, a highlight. So we just hit the pavement and we do the flyers and unfortunately kill some trees, you know? But we make sure that people know um, uh, that this is happening. We make it public, we make it at the library, at the public park, and we, we collaborate with universities. Um, we collaborate collaborate with local government, with collaborate nonprofits. Um, as her name says, Alapata Collaborative, our main goal is to collaborate and not reinvent the wheel. So if someone has already done it in the past, we don't want to do it again. We just want to work with them so we can do it in a better fashion and, and, and something that's adaptive to our community. So the best way to include the community is to let them know that this is happening and let them know why they should, why it matters to them. I would encourage everyone to simply start the conversation. Yes. Uh, when I started doing uh, uh, online, it was during the pandemic. So we shifted from in-person gatherings to online. And, you know, we didn't, we didn't know now, I didn't for sure what we know now. You know, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't know then what we know now, but don't let that stop you is simply, Put it out there, start the conversation, find your allies. Um, and I was amazed at how many of the environmentalists and policy people sought us out because we had simply started the conversation. Um, that's excellent. Worry. And I think that that's something that we can all continue to do now that, you know, long beyond this session, we've started a lot of great ideas. You both have shared some very, very practical tactics. And if I guess there's one thing we all can continue to do now is just to start the conversation, right, and keep it going. And so I thank you both uh, for representing your organizations, the Bayou Cultural Collaborative, the Alapata Collaborative CDC. We put a lot of links and resources in the chat and we appreciate all of your time uh, both to our panelists and to the audience for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you.